Hi. <laughs> Damn it. Hi, I'm Jacqueline. And I'm Courtney. And this is Caffeinated Crimes. <laughs> You're going to leave that in, aren't you? Oh, 100%. I'm going to leave that in. <laughs> also, <laughs> I feel like most of the time when my voice cracks, it's like, if you like haven't spoken for a while and then like your phone suddenly rings and you know, you answer it, it kind of, mm-hmm. but like, we've been talking for 15 minutes. So I don't know. Why. <laughs> I don't yeah. know where it was like, Ooh, let me just. Uh... Oh yeah. As soon as I heard that, I was like, this is staying in a hundred percent staying in. <laughs> oh boy. Also, we only talked for 15 minutes, which is like That's nothing impressive. for us. Like we just jumped right in. Cause we're both, we did see utterly exhausted twice yesterday too. Yeah, that is true. That is true. So. For for like a good chunk of time as well. Because mm-hmm. normally it's like, oh, we may see each other, but it's, you know, a brief little. But no, like we saw each other for a good like six hours, five yeah. hours last night. And there was so. nothing like drama that we had to like discuss yeah. after was it, was it either. Yeah, it was a chill night where everything went smoothly and yeah. according to plan. So we didn't have a lot to, you know, rehash or anything. So it was a very sweaty night. And I woke up feeling so dehydrated from drinking and sweating (laughs) to the point where even Kevin was like, I should have made you drink more water because you were sweating so, so much, basically. Yeah, (laughs) yeah, that's true. I mean, we definitely, it was very, very hot. There was not a lot of airflow. We needed some hydration to keep going. Courtney made me do a shot, guys. It was just, it got pretty wild, you know. (laughs) I didn't make you. You (laughs) agreed to. I'm just gonna say I turned it down once and you asked me again. So I mean that's pretty much you making me because I'm like, well shit, okay. <laughs> I mean, I guess, but, but I don't okay, peer I will... pressure anyone. Because Vanessa yes. asked her second time and she said no. The second time, and I respected that. I was going to say though, like you asked me the first time and I said no, and then you went and you ordered your shots and did them with whoever. And then you asked me again and I said yes. But I also was because I was thinking about that and I was like, but if I said no, I was like, then she would have get, gone on about her business versus some people would like yeah. con- continue pressuring and like, no, I'm really not going to. And they would order it anyway. And then I'm like, well, you just wasted your money because I'm literally not going to drink that, you know, and that gets uncomfortable. I, yeah, so I know I that you would not. And I also that. remember the last time I took a shot with you. So I was like, yeah. I'm not going to push it. Yeah. Yeah. But last night went much better than the last time. <laughs> so. Yeah. Cause the first shot I took with <laughs> Tiffany, then the second shot, I was like, none of these people want to take a shot with me. So I was like, Kevin, <laughs> will you take a shot with me? And then the third time you and Forrest took a shot with me, but uh, yes, yes. Which I'm going to cut this, but another reason yeah. I'm dehydrated is because I woke up three times in the middle of the night, shitting my brains out <laughs> with fiery poops <laughs> that I thought I was going to die. <laughs> that definitely makes sense why you're dehydrated <laughs> 4 a.m 6 a.m 8 a.m oh god i oh, woke god. up and like laying back in bed with it burning oh god whoever let me eat chipotle and then hot chicken tenders should go to jail and it's me i should go to jail <laughs> then but... followed by liquor i mean there's just so much happening <laughs> yeah anyway <laughs> okay i really think you should leave that in <laughs> Okay, I'll leave it in. You know what? <laughs> I'll leave it in. I left in your voice cracking. I'll leave in. <laughs> the other reason that I had the the dads the day after drinking shits. I'll leave it in. <laughs> Gordy's like, I have no shame. I'm just putting it out there. Normalize women shitting their brains out. Oh, man. I'm pretty sure morbid. It was probably a while ago now because I'm so behind on everything. But I know Ash did an episode and was like, basically talking about shitting her brains out the day before so you know it's it's fine <laughs> it happens it happens you know <laughs> sorry oh, to man. ruin any illusion of me not shitting but it happens women don't I eat poop. so much spicy food <laughs> <laughs> oh boy but that's how our weekend went um which is why Courtney and I are just completely exhausted today um but we do have a few updates before we get into this episode so we're gonna go ahead and go through those really quickly um, so the first one is Danny Masterson from that 70s show was found guilty of two of three counts of rape. Um, and he was charged in the rape of three women from 2001 to 2003. And he is facing up to 30 years in prison. So that kind of came out a few years ago. He was officially found mm-hmm. guilty. He'll be sentenced sometime soon. Yeah. It's like, good God. Like how many more, like how many times is this going to come out? from how many different people just and these are the only the ones that we know about and it's like there's so mm-hmm. many more that 
it's, it's never going to come forward. You know, it's just insane. Because I don't remember what Kevin and I were talking about. Oh, we were talking about um, the running back, Jim Brown, who was also an actor and he recently died, but apparently he was a really bad person. Like, and mm-hmm. the, the thing I saw was that he would like go to the Playboy Mansion and like beat and rape women and no one did anything about it. Um, oh my God. But he was like also charged with other stuff. But Kevin was like, the problem is it's like, 2000s and beyond like you just know they're probably a shitty person and so then it's like you're not even surprised and then when someone is a good person you're like oh wow but you're just like waiting for their shoe to drop with like all these like older stars like this yeah very true very true um so pretty scary in portland oregon right now um so there have been the remains of six different women discovered um around the portland area in the last four months um, so 22 year old Kristen Smith was found in the Pleasant Valley neighborhood. Um, she had been reported missing back in December. Um, 32 year old Joanna Speaks, um, was found close to an abandoned barn in Ridgefield and her cause of death was reported to be blunt force trauma to the head and neck. Um, a 24 year old Charity Lynn Perry was found near Ainsworth State Park on April 24th. Um, her death was reported as being investigated as suspicious, but they haven't released like cause of death or anything. And on April 24th, an unidentified woman was found in the Lentz neighborhood. Um, so they believe that she was between the ages of 25 and 40, that she may have been Native American or Alaska Native. She was around five foot one and weighed 135 pounds. Um, and she does have two noticeable scars on her left lower leg and two tattoos, including a black music note with the letter V on her left upper chest and a Buddha tattoo on her right shoulder blade. And she did have medium length black hair. So if you are in that area and you know anything about who this woman could be, you know, please come forward because her remains are still unidentified at this time. Um, Milwaukee resident, 31-year-old Bridget Webster, was found close to Mill Creek on April 30th. Her death is being reported as suspicious as well. And 22-year-old Ashley Reel was found on May 7th near Eagle Creek. Um, and again, no cause of death, but they did confirm that her that it was being treated as a suspicious death. Um, but apparently the poli- the Portland Police Department have like released a statement saying they don't think these cases are connected. And I'm like, I don't know what information, I mean, they may have information, of course, that they have not released, but I'm like, how much information do you really have to be able to say definitively at this point when none of these are solved, but Mm -hmm. you can say, oh, we don't think they're connected. I don't know what that could be. Um, So for, you know, the sake of safety, let's assume they are connected. And if you are in that area, you know, please stay safe. I mean, this is um, six women all in the same pretty close age range found in very similar areas. So please stay safe if you guys are in that area and hopefully we'll have more information on cause of death and any other forensic evidence that they may have. And if this is one person or if they just happen to have a lot of very similar murders around at this time, but that's a a large number. So yeah very scary please stay safe um yeah especially when there's just like no information it's like what's happening yeah exactly and and for them to like come forward and be like well we don't think they're connected and i'm like okay but but why i feel like you need to Mm -hmm. i get you can't share too much to like impede an investigation but can you share enough to make people feel safe without just being like oh no you're totally fine like they're not connected because uh we've seen that many times before where they were in fact connected and it was a serial killer so yeah yeah definitely stay safe out there um and our last update leslie van houten um who was a part of the manson family and had a pretty heavy role in the tate and la bianca murders um Mm -hmm. could possibly be granted parole and released so Um, Basically, uh, the second district court of appeals kind of reversed a decision um, made in 2020 from California Governor Gavin Newsom. Um, He like denied her release, basically kind of saying something along the lines. I think like she doesn't feel remorse, like she doesn't she still just does not care, basically. And the court is just saying there's no evidence to support those conclusions. So there is a chance her lawyers could apply for her to get parole and she could be released at some point so crazy 
Yeah. Yeah, very much so to think that anyone who was involved in those like horrific murders that were at a point where they could be released. I mean, just I mean, and some of them have already been released, but wild, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and get into today's case. Um, So our sources were a Britannica.com article, an article from the National Museum Australia, History.com, a University of Sydney article. And we also used Wikipedia because a lot of like all of their sources are referenced, but they are Australian news articles that we don't have access to like the actual copy of the article here in the United States. So we hope everything is correct. If you guys are in Australia and anything is incorrect, please let us know. Um, Even better if you have like copies of sources that we can actually access that you could send to us, that would be Mm -hmm. fantastic. But from what I can tell, everything is pretty accurate, but to just want to put that disclaimer at the top. Which I notice a lot in these international cases, it's like we cannot access these articles. So is that the same? Like if you're in Australia, can you just not access Mm. any like US articles or is that just yeah. something that is easy to access. I don't know. That's what I just wonder. Hmm, yeah. Our international listeners, please let us know. Because yeah. Is the U.S. just like an open book and we just let you have everything <laughs> versus you guys keep it tight? <laughs> it's me. Lip. I'm the U.S. <laughs> I'm the U.S. <laughs> I share everything. I have no secrets. <laughs> like... You share everything and make everyone else leave in their shit talks on the podcast. Yes. You encourage that. You know, I want everyone else to share as well <laughs> you know that's have you seen i'm so sorry to get off topic already um this tiktok that she was like i don't understand the concept of tmi when she's like when people start talking and they're like tmi but blah, blah blah and she's like no there is no such thing as too much information she's like i want to know literally everything <laughs> like never start something with tmi Be like no i need to know all of this yeah. all of the details <laughs> that's me okay sorry guys it's gonna get serious now so So on April 28th, 1996, the worst mass murder in Australian history resulted in the deaths of 35 people and left another 18 injured. This led to Australia's strict gun reform laws, which have virtually eliminated mass shootings in the country even 27 years later. So 28-year-old Martin Bryant had an intellectual disability and a history of erratic behavior. Um, He was very disruptive in school and was kicked out a few times and forced to attend a special education school at one point. He was known to abuse animals and sometimes pick on other students, although he was often bullied himself also. And psychiatric reports from his teenage years say he may be schizophrenic, couldn't read or write, and would always have trouble holding down a job. And reports would later show that he had an IQ of about 66. He dropped out of school in 1983 and was able to receive a disability pension after a psychiatric evaluation determined he would likely never be able to work long term. In 1987, at 19 years old, he started working as a handyman for a 54-year-old woman named Helen Harvey. So she was a lottery heiress who was very wealthy, and the two became good friends. And after Helen's mother passed away, Bryant moved in with her. Um, So the two spent a lot of time together. They would just spend extravagant amounts of money. Like at one point, they bought 30 new cars in a three-year time period, which... What in the world? (laughs) Where where are these cars? Like, what can you even do with that many cars? Yeah, like, are you keeping all 30? Or are you just, like, buying a new one, taking it back, or selling it? Buying a new one, selling it? Like, yeah. Like, what's happening? Yeah, I'm like, what is the process here? Um, but like I said, they were pretty good friends, and Bryant eventually became the beneficiary of Helen's estate. Um, so Bryant was reassessed for his disability pension sometime around this time, and the report noted that his father protected him from anything that might upset him, and also said that Bryant said he wanted to go out shooting people, and the report's basically like it would be dangerous for him to be outside of his parents' control, like he needs to remain like under their, you know. Like uh like a like they need to make his decisions and yeah. Kind of thing, yeah, like, like I don't think there was yeah, I don't think it was a, a legal thing in place, but they're basically like, no, like he needs to be taken care of by uh-huh. his parents. In 1992, Helen and Bryant were in a car accident together, which killed Helen and left Bryant injured. Um, so at this point, Bryant inherited all of Helen's money. So many did wonder if he was responsible for the crash. And apparently he was known to grab the wheel while she was driving, 
but he denied doing it like on this occasion. But supposedly this had happened before and caused Helen to wreck at least three times prior to her death. And so she like told her friends this is why she wouldn't drive more than 40 miles per hour with him in the car with her. Why would you ever drive it one time and you're out of my car, bud? Right? You're in the I'm back like, seat what? for life. What? Like you're in the trunk. Like, what are you doing? Like at least three times. No wonder she's yeah. buying 30 new cars in three years. He's wrecking them all. True. That's what the, yeah. <laughs> yeah, three times. And then she's also like, oh, well, like I tell my friends, like, that's why I don't drive more than 40 miles per hour with him in the car because like I know he's gonna do this. My goodness. Yeah. So he was never charged like in her death or anything. Like there's no proof that he was involved, but a lot of people are like, "Mm, this is pretty suspicious. If like Mm -hmm. you've had a history of doing this and you've now inherited like all of her money. So Brian's father, Maurice started looking after the farm where he and Helen had lived after her death. And in August of 1993, a friend who was looking for Maurice um, at the property found a note taped to the door that said, call the police. So police arrived and searched the property and divers eventually found Maurice dead in a dam with a belt around his neck and his death was ruled as a suicide. So after his father's death, Bryant began traveling overseas a lot. And like a lot of people remembered him just like trying to have conversations with anyone like on the plane or on trains or um, like at like restaurants or whatever that he's just like trying to talk to people because Mm -hmm. he basically has no one left in his life anymore like his best friend is gone his father is gone and he is just trying to like connect with anyone that he can and they don't think there's anything suspicious in maurice's death no i mean not that yeah and nothing that i've read no i'm not saying there is but just you know yeah (laughs) I don't think so. Okay. Um, Because the the call the police note, I don't know if they like matched it to his handwriting or I don't know, but but people seem to think that like Martin Bryant went on to do what he did because of his father's death, which yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but but nothing I read said that they believed that he was responsible or anything. Okay. Um, but he would start like dressing very lavishly and would like tell all these random people that, oh, he has this lucrative career. But then other people who were around who kind of knew of him were like, well, everyone knows that he's lying. Like he like thinks that he's passing himself off as this wealthy and prestigious person. But everyone's like, everyone knows that's not true. Um, he also started stockpiling guns and drinking alcohol frequently. And he did start acting suicidal in 1995. And he would tell people that he had had enough, that he felt people were against him. And when he tried to be friendly, people would just walk away. And then Bryant told a neighbor that he was going to do something that would make everyone remember him. So on April 28th, 1996, Bryant drove to the Seascape Cottage, which was a nearby inn that his father had previously tried to purchase with three high-powered firearms. He did shoot and kill the elderly owners of the inn, David and Nolene, who went by Sally Martin. And Bryant claimed that his father was depressed over not being able to purchase the inn, which is what led to his suicide. He also said that the owners had deliberately purchased this inn out from under his father and then refused to sell him another inn they had for sale. So he like really had a vendetta like against this couple specifically and thinks that they were somehow involved in his father's suicide because he wasn't able to purchase these inns that they then purchased. Which I guess if you you do have like a lower IQ kind of thing, you're just trying to find anything to cope with that. That is true. Um, So after he shot and killed them, a couple did stop to like check out the inn and Bryant met them outside and told them that they couldn't check it out because his parents were away and his girlfriend was inside. So it's kind of like trying to get them to leave. And the couple said that he was like really rude and made them feel uncomfortable. So they left and remembered that it was around 1235 p.m. when they left the inn. So Bryant locked the doors to the inn and took the keys with him. Bryant then drove to Port Arthur, which is a former penal colony that was a populist tourist destination in Tasmania at that time, which still is probably. I don't know why I said at that time, but I wasn't for sure. So I just wanted to (laughs) clarify that. Um, But it's a a tourist destination, um, like historical site kind of thing. So he drove past the site to another property that was owned by the Martins, the couple that he had shot at the inn, and he spoke with a man named Roger Larner, who he had met before, and Bryant told Larner that he was considering buying the Martins' property, like that's why he was there. 
Then at 1.10 p.m., Martin Bryant paid the entrance fee to the Port Arthur historic site and parked his car. He went to eat at the Broad Arrow Cafe, carrying a large bag and a video camera, and ate his meal outside. So the cafe was very small, and it was pretty busy that day because a lot of people were there waiting for the next ferry. And Bryant appeared nervous and kept looking back to where his car was. Um, he did try to like start up a conversation with some of the other patrons, like he seemed to do often, specifically about the lack of wasps in the area, how there weren't as many Japanese tourists as usual, just kind of weird out there topics, you know. Mm -hmm. He then pulled a semi-automatic rifle out of his duffel bag and began shooting. At the table beside him, he murdered Mo Yi William Ng and Su Ling Chung, who were visiting from Malaysia. Um, Mick Sargent was hit, but not killed, and his girlfriend, 21-year-old Kate Elizabeth Scott, was shot and killed. 28-year-old New Zealand winemaker Jason Winter had been helping the cafe staff with his wife Joanne and their 15-month-old son Mitchell, and Jason threw a serving tray at Bryant, which gave time for Joanne's father to push her and the baby under a table. 44-year-old Anthony Nightingale stood up and yelled, no, not here, and was then fatally shot. Shots were also fired at 68-year-old Kevin Vincent Sharp, 66-year-old Walter Bennett, and 67-year-old Raymond John Sharp. Um, all three were killed and had had their backs turned to him, so they kind of, like, weren't really aware of what was happening yet, because this, uh, I mean, all happened so quickly. This is mm -hmm. a semi-automatic rifle. It can, that that's the point, you know? Mm -hmm. um, Gerald Broom gave either Fiddler or Fiddly, and John either Fiddler or Fiddly. So it made it seem like they were a married couple. So I'm going to assume that one source got the last name wrong, but they could just be a married couple that happened to have the last names Fiddler and Fiddly. Mm -hmm. So I just want to put both of those out there just in case. So we're really sorry if one of those is wrong. Um, but those three were all hit by stray bullet fragments, but survived. And Thelma Walker and Pamela Law were hit by bullet fragments as well before their friend Peter Crosswell dragged them to the ground. Um, Patricia Barker was also hit by these fragments. Graham Coiler, Carolyn Lofton, and their 15-year-old daughter Sarah Lofton had been eating when Graham was hit in the jaw. Sarah ran towards her mother, and her mother threw herself on top of her daughter. Bryant shot Carolyn in the back and Sarah in the head, which fatally wounded Sarah. Mervyn and Mary Howard were both fatally shot as well. And then Bryant stood near the exit, preventing anyone from leaving. He then moved to the gift shop, which is when Robert Elliott stood up. Martin shot him in the arm and head, but he survived. Uh, many began hiding as Bryant moved to the gift shop. And 17-year-old Nicole Burgess and 26-year-old Elizabeth Howard were working in the gift shop. And Bryant shot and killed both of them. Gwen Neander was shot and killed despite his attempt to escape. Bryant then moved back to the cafe after seeing movement there. He shot Peter Crosswell, who was hiding under the table, and then fatally shot Jason Winter. Dennis Olson was hit by bullet fragments at this time, but survived his multiple injuries. Bryant then reloaded and fatally shot Ronald Jerry, Peter Nash, and Pauline Masters. And 20 people were killed in the first two minutes with a total of 29 shots fired and 12 other people were wounded. So... Again, a lot of people really quickly. Like just, I mean, really take time to like let those numbers sit with you. Two minutes and 29 shots were fired that killed 20 people and wounded 12 others. Yeah. I, I'm i sorry to get on my soapbox so early in the episode. Like, you know what's coming at the end too. But anyone who like has an argument that, oh, if you want to do this, like you'll do it with whatever weapon... A knife is not going to kill 20 people in two minutes. Yeah. Like, just, even a handgun will not no. do that. Yeah, exactly. It only has what, like, not that many bullets, but they, they, they yeah. didn't have to reload. Yeah, exactly. Sorry, continue. So he continued shooting as he escaped in his car, um, also killing two tour bus drivers and passengers on those buses. Driver Royce Thompson was shot in the back of the head. Bridget Cook was trying to guide people between the buses to cover, but Bryant saw them and started shooting. Winifred Applin was fatally shot while running for cover, and Yovana Lockley was shot in the cheek but was able to hide and survived. A couple who owned a wildlife park on the east coast of Tasmania, Janet, or some articles spelled it like Jeanette, like with a T on the end, so Janet or Jeanette, and... Neville Quinn were both shot. 
Doug Hutchison was attempting to get onto a bus when Bryant shot him. He then went to his car and exchanged his weapon for a self-loading rifle. When Bryant returned, he shot and killed Janet Quinn, who was on the ground after being shot earlier. He then fatally shot Elva Gaylard as well. Gordon Francis was on one of the tourist buses and was attempting to shut the door when Bryant approached and shot him. He survived but would need four major operations. Neville Quinn had escaped but returned to the area looking for his wife, Janet, um, and Bryant shot at Neville twice before he escaped onto a bus. Bryant then got on the bus and said, no one gets away from me, and shot Neville in the neck. Nanette Mayak and her children, three-year-old Madeline and six-year-old Alana, were running away from the area when Bryant approached in his car. He slowed down and opened the door, and Annette approached, likely thinking like someone was offering to help them, um, and he ordered her on her knees and shot her and both of her children. 39-year-old Andrew Bruce Mills and 53-year-old Leslie Dennis Lever were also shot and killed sometime during the shooting spree. So Bryant then left Port Arthur, stopping at the toll booth at the exit of the historical site. So Mary Rose Nixon, Russell James Pollard, and Helene and Robert Salzman were inside their BMW at the toll booth. Bryant shot and killed all four of them, removed them from their vehicle, and drove off in it. So... Again, he's literally just killing anybody he comes across, like anybody. Yeah. And it's, it's at this point, it's like you're leaving, like you're escaping, but you intentionally are like flagging down people who are running away to like mm-hmm. lure them in to kill them. Like there's no, I mean, obviously there's no logic behind this at yeah. all from the beginning, but yeah. It's, yeah. So he stopped at a gas station in front of the Port Arthur General Store where he killed Zoe Hill or possibly Hall. It was shown different, different places, and then took her boyfriend Glenn Pears hostage in the BMW before returning to a, a guest house at the Seascape Cottage. He continued shooting at cars along the way. So still just shooting at anyone, everyone. So police arrived at the inn and surrounded it, trying to negotiate with Bryant. Bryant shot at them, and this continued throughout the night. And the next morning, after an 18-hour standoff, he set the building on fire and attempted to run, but was caught. And he had killed Glenn at some point in the night, and police found his body along with the owners of the inn. So Bryant would later say that the shooting rampage occurred to him four to 12 weeks before the murders. Um, Some say he was inspired by Thomas Hamilton, who killed 16 teachers and a student at the Dublin Primary School in Dublin, Scotland, just a few months before. Dunblain. Oh, Lord, I know I pronounced that wrong. You said it so confidently that I was like, oh, she must know. Because, like, as soon as it was coming up, I was like, oh, oops, I forgot to look this up. And I was about to look it up. And then you just like went and I was like, oh, she knows it. She's got this. Should we do a real time fact? (laughs) Yeah, one second. Um, that's something I did learn from my high school band director is anything you do, do it with confidence and people will believe you. <laughs> it's done, Blaine. Done, Blaine. Done, Blaine. I, I said that after I finished saying it. So I just forgot the end when I first said it. So. <laughs> Oops. I mean, it sounded great. I was just, you convinced me. <laughs> this yeah. dumb American, you convinced this one. <laughs> so it's okay. <laughs> Sorry, all of Scotland, but we real time corrected. <laughs> <laughs> In 1996, gun laws varied across Australian states and territories. Colonial gun laws have been inherited from British common law, and access to guns was originally limited to settlers and police and military overseeing conflicts. Um, Criminal use began to increase as guns become more common, and many First Nations communities were murdered in acts of gun violence by colonists in frontier conflicts. So gun laws increased in parts of the country, but some areas still had more relaxed gun regulations, and the import of military-style rapid-firing weapons was banned in 1991, but many remained in circulation. So less than a month after the Port Arthur massacre, federal and state legislators led by Prime Minister John Howard created the National Firearms Agreement. So this new gun law enacted extensive licensing licensing and registration procedures, including a 28-day waiting period for purchasing a gun. All fully automatic or semi-automatic guns were also banned under this law unless the purchaser could provide a valid reason for owning one, and self-defense was not considered a valid reasoning under this law. Because 
that's what a normal handgun's for. Yeah, which I couldn't find like what a valid reasoning would be for like an individual. You know, like this, mm-hmm. like they're not talking about like military. So I'm like, what? I I couldn't find what a valid reason would be would be mandatory safety training was also now required in order to purchase a gun australia also instituted a federal buyback program in which the federal government would purchase guns from citizens willing to surrender them and this resulted in the surrender of seven hundred thousand guns and there have been no mass shootings categorized here as the deaths of more than five people at once in australia since then so gun control works yes also um second real-time correction sorry guys so the having to provide a reason is for all guns not okay not automatic i I think i think automatic and semi-automatic were let me quit talking on my fucking ass for a second (laughs) hold on (laughs) i'm very sorry guys okay yes so all automatic All automatic, semi-automatic, and pump-action shotguns are completely banned, and you do have to provide a genuine reason for getting, you know, any other type of gun. So when you're applying Mm -hmm. for this license, your 28-day waiting period, all of that. So the genuine reasons include sport or target shooting, recreational hunting, primary production. I don't understand what that means. Mm -hmm. Um, Pest control. It is Australia. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of creatures I've there. I've seen the big spiders. Uh, yeah. Uh, business or employment, rural occupation, animal welfare, or firearm collector. So those are the genuine reasons for purchasing one of these allowed guns. Okay. So fully automatic, semi-automatic, and the other, nobody can have under any reason. Everything else, you just have to provide a reason. Yes. And yeah. Only determine. like government agencies, like military, like they're allowed to... Yeah. Use them, but not like any individual, like just purchasing them. Yeah. Martin Bryant was held at the Royal Hobart Hospital while awaiting trial. Um, He was heavily guarded by police and at least two people applied to become security guards in the hopes of seeking revenge against Bryant. Because, I mean, he killed so many people. It does not surprise me that he had plenty of people wanting to then kill him. Oh, yeah. I mean, like, just even thinking of immediate family members mm-hmm. of the people that he killed i mean 35 a people three and, and a six-year-old i mean in addition to everyone else yeah. but like children and like everybody like yeah. like intentionally sought out the three and six-year-old like mm-hmm. not even that they just happened to be in the line of fire that they happened to get in his way he was leaving and intentionally like called them to him yeah to shoot them like yeah i can only imagine the number of people who were want ready to, to. yourself yeah yeah honestly so psychiatric reports at this time said he may have conduct disorder adhd or asperger's another psychiatrist reported that bryant did not have any conduct disorders and was distressed and disturbed but not mentally ill so he was eventually ruled competent to stand trial and his trial started on november 7th 1996 He initially pleaded not guilty, but his court-appointed attorney convinced him to plead guilty because, I mean, the evidence against you, my guy. (laughs) Right? Like, and I'm sure that guy's like, I, or woman is like, I'm not wasting my Mm -hmm. time to defend this case because there's, this is never going to end in your favor, you know? Yeah. And two weeks later, he was sentenced to 35 life sentences plus 1,652 years in prison without the possibility of parole, obviously. (laughs) Don't think he's going to live past 35 life sentences plus 1,600 years. Yeah, plus 1,600. (laughs) Like, when I read that, I texted Courtney immediately and I was like, wow, I've literally never seen this before. Yeah, so he's not going anywhere. He was in solitary confinement under suicide watch for the first eight months and remained in protective custody until November of 2006 when he was moved to a secure mental health unit. So Bryant has attempted suicide at least twice during his imprisonment and is currently housed in the maximum security Risden prison near Hobart. Um, The Port Arthur tour site was closed for a few weeks and eventually the Broad Arrow Cafe was rebuilt and is now a quiet a place for quiet reflection with a monument and memorial garden. And that is the Port Arthur Massacre with 
a lot of victims. Yeah. Uh, There are no words for like how horrific this case is. And there are also no words for like the rage that I feel researching this case and also briefly looking into the Dunblane case and many other countries that this happens and then it never does ever again because their countries put laws in place that clearly you can see. Same with New Zealand just a few years ago happening. when that mass shooting yeah. happened and then they immediately enacted gun control. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing is it's like, I love how people love to say like, gun control doesn't work and it's like but it does and like that's the thing like even these attacks you hear like of course they're horrific when you hear a knife attack or anything like that but think of how many people bryant killed how many people and he could not do that unless he had one of these weapons that you can just go in and shoot and shoot and shoot and it doesn't stop you don't have to stop you don't have to reload after six to eight shots um it, you don't even have to be accurate. <laughs> you don't even have to yeah, be accurate. Exactly. You just let her rip. That's the thing too. Like, cause we hear so many that like, you know, so many people are shot or they shot this many, you know, bullets, but then only this many people were killed because like you said, like you have to have good aim with other types of weapons, but with these, you just spray and go. And it's mm-hmm. like, you can quickly hit so many. And with a knife, like you said, you're not going to be able to hurt that many people. And you also have, like this many people against one they're going to be able to defend themselves but Mm -hmm. against this type of weapon there is literally no way like if anyone has a gun or even like like you said just like a regular handgun that you're gonna have to like reload after so many and we've seen that before too where um someone is able to like tackle the shooter and like get the gun away from them and you know whatever and that's possible in some of these cases but with these types of weapons it's just not like yeah yeah so i think we've been on our soapbox long enough for you guys to know how we feel about the subject and i'm sure anyone listening agrees with us and yeah we're preaching to the choir at this point and if you don't agree yeah. um i don't really know what to say because we just gave you a proof yeah why we need gun control and why it's just important because people are dying in mass shootings almost every day at this point in america and nothing happens i was just double checking that like our terminology wasn't like like, I'm making sure that in the U.S. you can still buy a semi-automatic gun. You know what I mean? Like, sometimes, mm-hmm. like, the, the terminology, but, yeah, you still can. So, just, okay. Yeah, just I know that sure people could buy, like, AK-47s and AR-15s and stuff, yeah. which are those type of weapons. So, yeah. So, yeah, like, I don't know what other um, information or proof for what you would need to, like I said, and and... So we talk about the side of like they completely banned these types of weapons, but they also put so many other restrictions on owning a weapon in general. Like you should not be able to just walk into a Walmart and buy a gun, which is possible in many places in the United States. And I I've heard like in like red comments where people are like, that's not how and like in some places it is like, yes, states are different. And there are some places that have, you know, more laws and more things that prevent that from happening. But in many places, like it is as simple as that. <laughs> like, in the state we currently live in, you do not have to have a permit. Yeah, which I always say is terrifying. I do not know how to operate a gun. I do not know how to clean a gun. I do not know how to store a gun. I mean, put it in a safe, I guess. Like, I don't know any of that. So, like, Mm -hmm. I only think it's logical that people need to get some sort of training to just understand their weapons to make them safe. And um, a waiting period, because we do see people in mental crises who... A lot of times, I know a lot of shootings I've heard of recently is because they were able to get this weapon so quickly. The The shooting in Nashville, the shooting in Louisville, Kentucky, the guy said, I'm proving mm-hmm. how easy it is for a mentally ill person to get a weapon. Um, just, yeah. we're literally asking not even for that much. A background check, mm-hmm. a waiting period. Maybe you have to take a class and have a permit just so that you understand how to care for weapons. And maybe some people like, like, that's the thing is people are like, well, it's common sense. You don't ever point a gun at somebody. And I'm like, people don't have common sense. People don't know that. Like, you need to like teach them and train them to like, understand that. Like, (laughs) yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, 
Yeah. I don't even know what else to say at this point. I'm just going to. Yeah. It doesn't matter as long as the NRA is still there. So. <laughs> yep. Yep. All right. We'll move on to our next segment, which hopefully is a little, uh, a little better. Um, Courtney, what is your perk of the week? So my perk of the week is I just bought a AK-47. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> what if I said that? What if that took that to us? My, my new gun is my what if perk I just of the week. went on this long yeah. rant and then no, that's not my perk of the week. Um, I don't have any of those, <laughs> but my perk of the week is last night. Uh, I got to go out with all my friends and celebrate my birthday a week later. And it was so much fun. Um, I just love getting everyone in the same place. And even though it was kind of hot and sweaty, it was still fun just to have everyone there <laughs> having some drinks. So we all sweated it out yeah. together. <laughs> um, and the boys got to watch the baseball game, which we won. Yes, the, thankfully, the longest baseball game in history. <laughs> <laughs> apparently not because we looked up the record but it was pretty damn long it was very long it just kept going <laughs> um yeah. but that's my perk of the week because it was just a really fun night and it's just always fun getting everyone mm-hmm. together and hanging out so yeah agreed and that is my perk of the week Jacqueline what is your perk of the week I mean sorry Courtney but that is also my perk of the week <laughs> um you know we don't get to go out too often you know we got to reserve the the babysitters for like the the big nights and not just like a random you know whatever so we got to tag on our our date night to Courtney's birthday celebration <laughs> so <laughs> but no it was a great time and I had a delicious sandwich I will say my sandwich at dinner was like so good um yeah and yeah then the place we went their food is just pretty good anything I've had time. I feel yeah. like it's it's good yeah it was very good. You get the hot chicken, it'll relax and punish you later. But <laughs> and Courtney already told you all about that hot chicken. So, <laughs> oh boy, well this has been a little unhinged because so are we, and yeah, we're both tired. So I think we're just gonna wrap this on <laughs> up. Um, if we fucked up anything in this episode, which I'm sure we did, please let us know. I'm sure I pronounced something wrong, and maybe at least I did it confidently, where you can just admire my confidence <laughs> that is true i always appreciate that um but you know where to find us all of our info is in the show notes um we are on patreon.com slash caffeinated crimes where you can find bonus episodes and we have pins and stickers i know you guys want a caffeinated crime sticker with our lovely little logo to put on your emotional support water bottle and all your other fun things and your computer and you know so if you guys want to mm-hmm. check that out and the other fun perks that we have um yeah please do so yeah and if you'll please give us five stars on apple spotify wherever you listen that has a rating system please give us the highest one give mm-hmm. us a thumbs up subscribe leave us a nice beautiful comment um but not a mean one because i don't want to hear it uh, <laughs> and yeah in the meantime go have a cup of coffee and don't commit a crime